What does the world of your story look like? Is it real or not? And if it's real, is it realistic? Or does it have a fictional feel to it? And if it's not real, does it feel realistic? Today we dive into all those aspects of your story setting, the world you create and invite your viewers and your characters into. We look at a number of aspects that help you build the world and ultimately we'll also look at how to write it down on the page. I hope you enjoy it. Many films have as a title a location. Uh, think about the movie Australia, Chicago, Munich, Madagascar, Philadelphia. Often the location refers to the real location. Here's Sunset Boulevard, that's obviously the real Sunset Boulevard, but it gets a deeper meaning, a different meaning. Same for Chinatown. Chinatown at the beginning of the film um, uh, doesn't have the same sort of impact as it has in that final line from the film. Forget it, Jake, it's Chinatown. So sometimes the location is real, sometimes the setting is an existing setting, and then you can borrow from the real world elements, which helps inform the story, gives it a sense of truth, honesty, a very similitude. Sometimes you'd build from scratch, and in certain genres, worlds are very different from what we encounter in our real lives. That gives you a certain amount of freedom, but it also forces you to set your own rules. Even fictional worlds have a great sense of reality or realism in certain cases. Kubrick took great care in setting up these worlds and many filmmakers who build their own worlds take their time to introduce you into that world and it sometimes takes significant screen time, minutes and minutes of um, almost sightseeing through that new world. The opening of Alien is a minute long travel through the Nostromo. We first see the Nostromo exterior and then we go interior and it is literally minutes and minutes before we see the first living creature. This use of detail is, is really important and really effective. That opening card with the details about the Nostromo, the technical details of Nostromo, number of crew, its cargo, and its course. If you remember Psycho, the opening of Psycho, the credits give us an exact time of day and place for the film. Sometimes the worlds are extraordinary. They're far from real. They're colorful, literally colorful. And 
many of the elements are new, so we need to take in new information. This is from Mad Max Fury Road. And the reason I showed you this short clip is to demonstrate that world building and setting uh, description is not just about the physical world. It's not just about the surrounds. It's also about the characters that inhabit those worlds, the creatures that live in it, and that will later become part of our story. So the more they become part of that world, the more realistic, the more credible and plausible your story will be. There's a sociological demographic aspect to it and our next clip from the same film illustrates this it's coming get, get ready yes. Yes. A portrayal of the inequalities and the abuse of power by the character of Immortan Joe in um, Fury Road. All this is intrinsically part of the world that's built and that immerses us in that film. Another uh, outstanding feat in that respect was Avatar, where James Cameron built the world of Pandora for years and years and years before he actually um, uh, brought it to the screen. Here's a very short clip in which we see the contrast between the natural beauty of Pandora and the minds and, you know, the human presence um, on that moon. Incredible visuals, but at the same time also important for the story that follows after that. Sometimes the world building is full of surprises and what we believe to be the world or the scale of the world and its inhabitants uh, turns out to be slightly different. Very important for the world building here is the social uh, demographic, the, the social structures as they are in an ant colony, but it will be uh, relevant to the story that follows. And again, as I said, that's intrinsic to your world. You, with your geographical location, you bring the inhabitants and relationships between the inhabitants as part of your world. Going to a film that wasn't so successful is still absolutely worth watching, and that's Alex Garland's Annihilation. 
incredible feat of world building there. Um, at the same time, quite challenging because in the script, it is often really difficult to describe something we have never seen. In Annihilation, there's the concept of the shimmer. First, I'm going to show you what it looks like and then uh, later we'll look at how that is described in the screenplay by Garland. And that then will segue into that other um, contrast that I mentioned previously, man versus nature, more specifically, the military versus nature. from Annihilation. Behind the women, the familiar, the compound. Before them, the unique, the shimmer. And that's um, where they go into Act 2. So this is almost literally the threshold. As they break through this wall, they break into Act 2. The next clip shows us another aspect of this world and another reference. In um, creating Annihilation, Alex Garland was inspired to a large degree by one of his favorite video games, um, The Last of Us. And those of you who are familiar with the game will recognize some of the imagery. There's beds and bags. You think people are here? We're here. Yeah, I'm gonna go with the past tense. Damn. Oh. So contrast between this dystopian world, um, a leftover of the human presence, the abandoned buildings, and then nature that's pushing in, that nature that's abundant and, and threatening to uh, remove the, the, those um, human creations. So you see that in Last of Us. Again, also the constant imminent threat, uh, the presence of military elements. The desolation, probably as well. Important when you build these worlds is a good balance between the unique and the familiar. I would imagine that if you are not familiar with that post-apocalyptic world, and there's a lot to take in, there's a lot that is new in Annihilation, maybe too much, maybe it is too weird and um, unfamiliar. Um, I enjoyed the film uh, to a large part because it kind of brought me back into that world that I enjoyed in the, in the game. So balance out the unique and familiar. Now, I think the failure of Annihilation was not necessarily the fault of the world building. It was probably an, an, a narrative issue. I've published an article about that if you're interested. Totally familiar, uh, although still quite unique, is that opening of the Fellowship of the Ring. It has been remarked by some that Hobbit's only real passion is for food. A rather unfair observation as we have also developed a keen interest in the brewing of ales and the smoking of pipe weed. But where our hearts truly lie is in peace and quiet and good till birth. For all hobbits share a love of things that grow. And yes, no doubt to others our ways seem quaint. <laughs> but today of all days, it is brought home to me. It is no bad thing to celebrate a simple life. And in many of those aspects, hobbits are just like humans. We ultimately like those simple things that make us happy, even if we don't live in that idyllic, perfect world of the Shire. Fantastical 
entirely non-existent, built from scratch by Tolkien, but with elements that we that are familiar to us. Sometimes we anchor our stories in existing locations, in real places that look exactly the way they look when you were to visit them. Better Call Saul, a wholly fictional story within a wholly fictional world, because what we see is a recreation of Albuquerque and New Mexico, but every now and then it's anchored in the reality. This is the actual train station of Albuquerque, and the actual um, uh, rail runner train where our character Mike arrives. What this does, the use of real location, is it gives you free access to existing detail, fine detail that you can use and that will be consistent with your world. This may look familiar to some of you, it's Canberra. It is the location for a true story set in the city called um, The Consolation of Joe Cinque. Uh, yeah, can I get um, an ambulance, please? What's the problem? Um, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble getting in. Can This is something that happened literally geographically close to us and it could happen to us. It could happen next door. And for some of us, it, it actually did happen next door. Contrary to this, many stories are set in generic locations, in some suburban street, somewhere in some town that looks like many others. This is the opening of one of my favorite horror films, It Follows. In this case, it's America, but it could be anywhere. Many streets around the world look exactly like this one. As you pick your location, as you build your world, you need to be aware of the rules you set for that world. And one of the rules starts with, is this a real existing location or is this something fictional? If it is fictional, you may, ha may have some uh, more freedom, some more liberty, but that means that you're going to have to set your own rules. At least they're keeping them separate from us. I want to be realistic with everyone. The aliens will not be able to go home. The aliens are here to stay. There were literally thousands of different theories as to why the ship seemed inoperable. And what was speculated was that a command module had detached itself from the main ship and then somehow mysteriously become lost. Did it fall by itself or was it programmed? I don't know. Examination of the old video footage it shows very clearly that a piece falls from the ship. New style opening of the film District 9, set in Johannesburg, helped make this film look real. And in that way also connected to real life issues through the metaphor that it built around this spaceship with refugee aliens. Other films create fictional worlds within existing worlds. Um, Matrix, most Australians will know that The Matrix was filmed in Sydney. All three films, all three Matrixes, although the rest of the world may not be aware because the landmarks are missing. And even if you look very carefully, it's hard to see where exactly we are.
in uh, other shots of the same film and, and the, the subsequent films, in the special effects skylines, you see they, they've been completely manufactured from the ground up and not resembling any existing city. You also need to set up other types of rules. And in The Matrix, there are certain physics, rules of physics that are defied as you read the description here, how Trinity moves and jumps from one roof to the next. Second paragraph, her movement so clean, gliding in and out of each jump, contrasted to the wild jumps of the cops. I'm going to go down now. The cops slow, realizing they're about to see something ugly as Trinity drives at the edge, launching herself into the air. But from above, the ground seems to flow beneath her as she hangs in flight, then hits somersaulting up, still running hard. That's not something that would happen in the real world. And we can tell from the response of the cop who says, Jesus Christ, that's impossible. So in this way, a new rule has been set up. The characters in this story move differently to ordinary human beings. This is one of the rules that The Matrix plays with. It's set up early and then taken through the entire film. Now, in Westworld, you have this, this setup, theme park, so to speak, that is its own world. But in later seasons, we leave the theme park and we go into the real world and we learn that the real world is, again, a fictionary version of our real world. It's not anywhere near uh, the world that we know we live in. Pushing these rules or expanding the reality often comes at a cost. And only a few days ago, I watched the first episode of Devs with my son, and he didn't buy it at all to his taste. There was just too much weirdness going on, and there, was, there were too many rules set up that he thought did, weren't necessary uh, that early in the story. And um, maybe that was the reason why I didn't dig it at all uh, either. Probably another reason might be that the storytelling was fairly, fairly slow. This is quite a, a strong image, and sometimes you need to weigh up um, the effect, the impact of an image versus its function in the story. The massive statue of the girl, we don't know why it's there yet. It will probably be clear late in later episodes. And then there's these trees that have metropolis type of lighting rings going around them. Um, there's a lot of imaginative imagery, but at this point, we don't really see the point of it all. Uniquely familiar, why? So you allow your viewers to feel at home when they go back to that show or when they watch the film. A place we want to spend time, even more so when it is a long-running TV show. At the same time, you try to make it fresh and surprising because you don't want it to go stale. And often viewers will reward you when they feel they learn something. There's something new that they didn't know that has some anchor in reality. I promised to go a little bit more deeply into television and games. Uh, and personally, I believe that world building is even more important in TV and games than it is in feature film. In feature film, you only need your world for about an hour and a half, two hours, two and a half for epics. In television, you need to bring your viewers back to that world over and over and over again. You don't want to exploit that world in a way that there's nothing left to be discovered or it gets stale. So it needs to be rich and it needs to be an aspect to that world that your audience loves enough so they keep coming back. I certainly have that with TV shows. I love Breaking Bad and, and uh, uh, Pet Call Saul partially because it's set in New Mexico and the New Mexico that these storytellers have created is something I love going back to. Um, same for the world of Big Little Lies. I thought it was a very strong, recognizable world and it probably isn't too close to the real Monterey because it was based on North Sydney, but it was believable enough for me to want to go back there. A few years back, I played a game called Borderlands that I found incredibly enticing. It was set in a world that I found fun and um, exciting and, and also surprising. And these are a few seconds from that game. You're a plague, bandit. You and your kind have corrupted Pandora with your greed and your hatred. It comes down to me to save this world from your kind. But I'm more than happy to do it. Huh. 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 
some elements of this world are vaguely reminiscent of Mad Max. Some of what we see here is kind of similar in its principles and its design elements to the, the Fury Road creatures and, and landscapes. Um, then again, there was there were a few more Mad Max movies before this game was released, so maybe Borderlands also borrowed from Mad Max. And in that way, the whole pop culture universe keeps borrowing from um, each other. Um, this is a version of Los Angeles that looks real. It has the shutters on the beach, yet it's a game. It's me in my car in Grand Theft Auto. This is Venice Beach. Some elements are very recognizable, but in others are entirely fictional. The world is more compact than we know it, but you will recognize a lot of um, familiar landmarks. And it looks like I'm drunk here. I guess I'm just still learning to drive in this game. If you're not for the violence of GTA, you may be more at home in the lush countryside that um, I have explored on my horse in Red Dead Redemption. And this is literally a game I spend hundreds of hours. Because it's quite relaxing at night when I'm too tired to watch a movie because I'll fall asleep. I just hop on my horse and explore the world of Red Dead Redemption. Some people say when you build a world, whether it be for film, television or games, sometimes it helps to build a map. This is the map of Red Dead Redemption. Well, it's um, its own landmarks, entirely fictional and quite a bit of detail. And it's large too. It takes a long time to explore this, uh, this map. You may not like any of those. It's all subjective, obviously, and subjectivity is critical to how we experience the worlds and even when we build the worlds. The worlds we build need to be somehow reflective of our characters and how they feel. I thought I was uh, suitable for this class. Some people might think this is wonderful, this is beautiful, it's Bruges. Others will disagree with you. As you can see, both characters think entirely different about Bruges. And this brings me to something student Shauna uh, uh, brought up after yesterday's class, and that is how the relationship of the character can change over time. As the, the character transforms, often their uh, relationship to the world changes as well. In this case, we notice it with Ray, but in many movies where there's a, an adverse relationship with the world, initially the character may come to appreciate or accept the world towards the end, or vice versa. They may learn that the world is not the right one for them and they may leave at the end. We'll look at how this was scripted in a minute. Um, now we're going to the most used location in movies, I think in the history of cinema, and that's Los Angeles. This is the opening description for... Nightcrawler. And it's remarkable how sparse it is compared to the number of shots of Los Angeles at the beginning of the film. Make no mistake, this is not the real Los Angeles. The images are real. They're taken 
probably without setting the scenes. This is what happens at night in Los Angeles, but it is a perspective of the city. It's a perspective that suited this particular story. It's one look at this city that serves the story of Nightcrawler. It's a very selective look. It shows the night creatures. It shows what happens in that under the cover of the night in a city that many only know by daylight. And that is, that, that is it's a fake version. It may have real aspects to it, but it's really stylized to serve the perception of our character of this city. More subtle, certainly, than the portrayal of Paris in movies like An American in Paris, where this is abundantly fake. Just look at it. No wonder so many artists have come here and called it home. Brother, if you can't paint in Paris, you better give up and marry the boss's daughter. We're on the left bank now. That's where I'm billeted. Here's my street. In the past couple of years, I've gotten to know practically everyone on the block. And a nicer bunch you'll never meet. Back home, everyone said I didn't have any talent. They might be saying the same thing over here, but it sounds better in French. I live upstairs. No, 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 not there. One flight up. Voila. Fake, why? Because it's rebuilt in the studio. Not much of what you've seen is actually real. This is a recreation of Paris, the romantic image that people have, mostly people have never been there. Kind of similar to what Woody Allen did with his Midnight in Paris. And again, a really good example of how a director takes great care in bringing us into a certain mood. In Midnight in Paris, he plays an entire jazz tune with just images of sightseeing uh, the city. There, there's nothing going on dramatically. There's not even a voice of any of the characters. Um, I won't play the whole sequence, just a short segment. Later, we'll see images of Paris in the rain, which emphasize the nostalgia, which is exactly what Woody Allen needed. So it was really tailoring the images of the city to, to um, suit the story that he's going to tell. In that respect, it's kind of similar. The approach is it's almost identical to what Gilroy did with Nightcrawler, uh, only at night for Los Angeles. So really a flavor of this city that fits the story really well. And do not underestimate how much work goes into that and as a writer you it's you're the first person to bring that into the story through the screenplay here's a, a, another example from spike lee introducing us to the brooklyn of do the right thing i have today's forecast for you hot the color for today is black that's right black so you can absorb some of these rays and save that heat for winter. So you want to get on out there, wear that black, and be involved. Also, today's temperature is going to rise up over 100 degrees, so that's a Jerry Curl alert. That's right, Jerry Curl alert. If you have a Jerry Curl, stay in the house or you'll end up with a permanent plastic helmet on your head forever. Early role for Samuel L. Jackson in uh, Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. Even the weather is part of your world. When you create your setting, this is one of the aspects you need to keep in mind together with the geography and the, uh, the sociology of your city. A really thorough analysis of the setting of Baltimore in The Wire you can find in the, the Wire Bible. So this is the David Simon's pitch to HBO for The Wire with a description of his version of Baltimore. Eastern Rust Belt City, majority black, with an ethnic element still clinging to certain quadrants as well as parts of the power structure. What he's describing here now is not Baltimore as the city that the people who live there know. This is the Baltimore that will appear in The Wire. So it means that these elements will play a critical role 
in the plot. The city is poor, undereducated, and struggling with huge heroin and cocaine problem. And then the final paragraph, downtown locales are better, more vibrant, but even there we have a sense that this is a city that has not seen its share of post-industrial investment. We go back to LA. This is Los Angeles as seen in the film Drive. Ultra stylized, again, to completely fit with the look and feel of the film. This is um, Los Angeles as seen through the eyes of uh, the driver in the film Drive. There are landmarks, there are recognizable elements, as you will see in the, the next short fragment, but they're so carefully chosen as to not give us the idea that this is the, the LA that you know. No, this is... Similar, very similar to the night crawler Los Angeles. It is LA at night. Here, it's possible to follow how the driver navigates through the actual streets of Los Angeles, and it's almost like a simulation. You are there, and it makes it all more plausible, despite the fact that the story is entirely um, fictional. The challenge for you as a writer is how much detail are you going to include in the screenplay without overburdening the read? Because at the same time, you want to have that verisimilitude, you want to have that immersion, the true-to-life nature, particularly if you're setting your story in an existing city, but at the same time you don't want to overburden the reader with detail. Stratification, I've mentioned that word, that is something that we see in that Bible by David Simon. What does it mean? Stratification is the act of sorting data, people and objects into distinct groups or layers. When you have a world with lots and lots of characters, which is certainly the case in The Wire, there are dozens and dozens of relevant characters over the seasons, it's hard to navigate through those and just keep a clear, uh, a clear view. The way Simon addresses this is he subdivides his characters into three strata. There's this station house with McNulty in the Bible, he's still called McArdle, Greggs and Daniels, those names were retained. Then we have the courthouse and the street with the dealers. So these are groups of people that have their own little microcosms and they interact. And where they interact, that's where the drama happens. That's where the clashes happen. I've shown you this end sequence from episode 401, um, Boys of Summer, where we see exactly that. We see the shots of the... Uh, the areas where these groups live. So the first one is here where uh, Chris and Snoop board up a house in the low rises in the poor area where the houses are vacant. It's not a place you want to live. And then we skip forward to the next scene, which is almost a tourist shot by the harbor, a park by the harbor, and this is Tommy Carcetti the character who's running for mayor. You've been drinking? He represents the courthouse. Oh, you need to be fine somewhere else. Parker? 
And then we end the show back on the street with one of the boys who was the lead in the A storyline of this particular episode. Actually, take that back. I don't know whether it was A. I never properly analyzed. It's one of the key storylines in that, that episode. Brings us to this segment where we talk about how setting becomes relevant on a scene basis as well. Because you're going to build your story world for your entire screenplay or for your entire season of television or for your game. But then you're going to have to make decisions on a scene by scene level. Halfway, Little Miss Sunshine, there's the meeting of Richard and Stan about the book. In the screenplay, this meeting is next to a dumpster in the parking lot of the hotel. And this is how the dialogue starts. Richard says, you said it would sell. Stan is, it's what I thought at the time. It's a great program. You said yourself, I don't understand. It's not a program, Richard. It's you, okay? No one's heard of you. Nobody cares. So this is a, a low point for Richard. Hence the choice of Michael Aaron to place this scene by the dumpster, which is obviously symbolic. And it emphasizes the emotional content of the scene. This is a really good criteria on how to choose where you're going to set the scene. You want to re realize a certain emotion. You want to create a certain emotional impact. Location is one of the elements you can play with. So where you set your scene will help you achieve that outcome. Richard exhales, shakes his head, gathers himself. And I'm going to show you what happens next in that scene. And what you'll notice is we're not in the, in the parking lot. What, what's the next step? There is none. We had our shot. It didn't fly. We move on. You, you, you mean give up? Hey, well, oh, hey, one setback here and, and you're ready to just quit? Richard, listen, I pushed this thing hard, okay? I rammed it down their fucking throats and no one bought it. It's time to move on. You're not going to win this one. Okay. Okay, you know what? Good. I'm glad. You know why? Because this is what the nine steps are all about. Right here, Richard, Stan. Richard. Right here. Richard. Please. Yeah, no, you blew it. You blew it, you're out. And the reason is probably because of the lighting, uh, or because they already had it set up in, the, in that hotel. Maybe there was no parking lot with dumpsters available. Who knows? Probably productional reasons. This is the opening scene in Chinatown. I have highlighted those elements that contribute to the world building on a scene scale. So this is how we experience Gittes' office in the screenplay. Rather than bundling all this detail up front and give us an information dump in terms of the setting, it's peppered throughout a dramatic scene. And you can do the same thing with your entire world, with your entire, uh, entire scene, uh, or rather, uh, story world building but rather than having that big chunk of description at the at the front which some screenplays have you basically spread it over the 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 drama and then the director can still choose to have this chunk of visual exposition at the front as we saw it in Nightcrawler and Midnight in Paris so here the details are the shiny desktop the fan overhead the lighter the wastebasket, the wall, the signed photos of movie stars on the wall, and the Venetian blinds, all contributing to that image, the visual image we are picturing in our minds for Giddes' office. Other examples of how you write things in the script, this is that example from In Bruges. Relatively sparse, if you look at the bottom. Pretty christmas tide streets from Minnewata Park to the Burg, past quaint chocolate shops, past horse and carts, canal boats, past tours, taking photos of all these. And then, um, yeah, by the end of the walk, we've passed most of Bruges picturesque places, none of which could be described as a shithole. This is um, the Description of the scene we saw from Avatar earlier on goes straight to the bottom. There's a lot of introduction. If you see, this is all description of the, the spacecraft and the planet, then Pandora the moon, 
the shuttle, and then we get to the rainforest. And only at the very bottom of this page, it says an open pit mine, lifeless crater, as if a giant cookie cutter took a chunk out of the world. Down among the terraces are excavators and trucks the size of three-story buildings. So Cameron is quite effective in describing all this material with, with verve, with, in, in a way that is fun to read. He uses similes. Usually you're advised against doing that, but hey, you know, whatever works, right? And this brings us to the end of today's class. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, why not give us a like and do subscribe to the channel so next time we have another masterclass for you, you will be notified. You can also attend these classes live and ask questions. Just look at the details underneath the video in the information box. There's everything you need to enroll for upcoming masterclasses. You can also sign up for our Immersion Screenwriting course. That's an online course that you can do entirely in your own time. It's an innovative approach. I love it and I think you should try it out. We also have a blog under the story department. And if you're working on a new story, you can test the ID using the Logline It website. That's logline.it. There's more that I can help you with. Just check out all the links underneath the video and maybe there's something that uh, suits you. Thanks for watching this time. Hope to see you next. Bye.